I found out about what blockchain really is, obviously I had heard about Bitcoin, but when I grasped the, the full potential of, the, of that technology, I thought we need to talk about it and we need to talk it about it more and we need to talk about it outside the tech meetups. So um, I started this blog but I, because I found it that uh, there is a lot of information. It's mostly white papers and videos online. And uh, last year there were very few books out yet. So this is how it started. The blockchain hub is like an information hub, a people hub and a think tank. But I have to admit we're that we're still building the information layer. Uh, we're still trying to translate into a human readable language what the blockchain is, not only technically, but what it actually means and what you could do with it. And we're also trying to make it local um, a lot of us uh, were very fluent in English, but there are so many people out there who are more comfortable with their no local native languages, and there is just this uh, material isn't out there yet. So uh, there are talks we organize, information talks, going to conferences, organizing meetups, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but ultimately also bringing people together on a very interdisciplinary level. Uh, because uh, blockchain, well, we're still building the protocol layer on one basis, fighting issues like, or working on issues like scalability, privacy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, we're trying to figure out potential business models on the blockchain. But at the same time, it's such a general purpose technology that it has um, an impact on so many other aspects, like uh, like a general, it will, there will be a shift in economic activities based on disintermediation, um, new business opportunities, much more peer-to-peer, -peer, um, and how will that impact our society? How will the blockchain uh, impact the future of law? Uh, what about the blockchain and the future of governance and democracy? So what we're trying to do at the Hub is like bring people together and talk about all of it. And what has happened recently, I was approached by many people um, outside Berlin. They're like, we also want to do something with you or like you. And I was like, okay, start your own blockchain hub, your own local blockchain hub, and this is what's happening. There will be a blockchain hub Amsterdam, um, Brussels, Graz, and Soest, so it's not necessarily just the main cities. And today I was talking to a few people who want to do their own local blockchain hub here in Paris and outside Paris, so if anyone is interested, please approach me after the talk. And, um, yeah, I guess we will talk more details the other thing. Thank you. Hey, folks. I got turned on to Bitcoin in 2013, just kind of paid attention a bit to it. Um, tried to launch a Bitcoin startup in 2014 that didn't pan out. Ended up driving for Uber. Um, end of 2015, wanted to be on the front lines of the sharing economy. Um, Uber was kind of under siege in my adopted hometown of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. The city council passed a pretty onerous ride-sharing regulation, so I said, you know what, I'm just going to sign up and drive for Uber and see what all the fuss is about. And while I was driving for Uber, you know, overall a good experience, but I just kind of chafed against some of their rules and regulations and, and kind of how they were structuring certain uh, things as a company. I thought, you know, and they're taking 20%, um, and I had known from studying Bitcoin – um, people applying Bitcoin and blockchain technology to just these sorts of situations where you have some middleman taking a cut for standing between really a rider and a driver providing some kind of service but probably there's a way to apply blockchain technology to decentralize that. Um, came up with the idea to pull the trigger on that. Um, did a successful soft launch there in Portsmouth just kind of testing out some basic proofs of concepts uh, set a goal of recruiting 100 drivers by the end of January uh, to help test a mobile app we would launch in February, which we did. Um, and we kind of lucked out on the timing because we announced that goal of signing up 100 drivers on January 6th. On January 8th, Uber cut rates across the board. The entire country, 40% overnight with no warning. Now, if you're a customer, you're pretty happy about that. If you're a driver... You're driving 40 to 50 hours per week expecting to pull home $1,200 or more, and now that's decimated 40% with no warning. You are pissed off. 
Do you go do you? Oh, we just switch over to Lyft, right? Uh, Lyft followed suit two days later. The exact same cuts across the board. That gave us a huge impetus. Uh, that that gave us a, a huge surge. You know, our goal was to sign up a hundred drivers. We signed up a hundred drivers um, uh, per day. We had to shut the process down. When we hit eighteen hundred, there was just so much interest pouring in from around the country of drivers who were tired of being mistreated, tired of having the rug pulled out from under them, and were just attracted to the idea of a company that started with a focus on what's going to make the drivers happy, take care of the workforce so that they can take care of the customers. That's how it should be. Um, since then, we've just gone from growth to growth. It's been absolutely crazy. Um, we're now, we've got some really big heavy hitters kind of in the Ethereum and blockchain space helping us craft a very... Uh, a powerful Ethereum integration. We're going to be using blockchain for a number of different things like uh, identity, reputation, payments, uh, eventually decentralized um, risk pools and insurance. We're going to be issuing a, an, a token, an arcade token that we're going to incentivize people to use uh, to pay for rides instead of credit card uh, payments. That's going to let us uh, take the fees down way lower than anyone else can compete. Um, and also just building a, a resilient, decentralized solution that no one can stop. A um, lot more to say, and uh, thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Greg McMullen. I am a lawyer, and I'm with a company called Ascribe, and uh, we're working on something called Big Chain DB, which is a scalable blockchain database. So it's been designed to solve the speed and capacity issues that we ran into with the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, Ascribe was doing registering art on the blockchain and allowing artists to transfer unique editions and track the provenance of artworks. Uh, but when we started talking to some larger galleries, we realized their collections were in the hundreds of thousands. And the Bitcoin transaction limit is theoretically seven transactions per second and caps out much lower than that in practice. So they would have been pretty upset with us if we tried to register hundreds of thousands of things uh, at one time. pre-selected. Rather than everyone being able to take part, you have pre-selected validating nodes. So if you are a consortium of banks, say, you could have your banker friends all control a node and you can trust all of them, maybe. Uh, but what about a public version? So that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, a version that anyone can build on that's operated for the good of the internet as a whole. So the reason we care about this is that uh, the, the crew behind Ascribe and BigChain uh, grew up with the internet of the 90s that was pretty exciting. It was this move toward decentralization uh, away from the IBM, sorry, mainframe model uh, toward, toward something where everyone had control of their own computer on their own desktop. And the web made that even more exciting. Uh, anyone could do basically whatever they wanted. But if we look around today, everyone is Facebook and Google and Uber and that decentralized vision didn't really play out the way we had planned. So if you want to live and play on this decentralized internet, or the mis this centralized internet under Facebook and Google, you have to play by their rules, which means you have to play by their censorship policies. So it's based on the lowest common denominator. Uh, in a recent incident where Facebook uh, took down photos of the Little Mermaid sculpture in Copenhagen, uh, for being too offensive, they said, some audiences within our global community may be sensitive to this type of content. You have to play by arbitrary rules, like real name policies that Google and Facebook have imposed. So you have to use the name on your official government issued ID. You might even have to provide them your ID. Uh, even if you go by a totally different name, if everyone has always called you by a different name, or even if you're in a community that could be further marginalized by having to use your real name. 
Uh, you have to play by national laws that try to reach across borders to impose bad laws internationally. And uh, we're here in France, which is uh, currently trying to force Google to play by its interpretation of uh, right to be forgotten. So the reason we're really excited about this is that a decentralized stack is coming, and we think we can be the database for it. We have Ethereum for processing. we built into the articles of incorporation for the not-for-profit. Nodes. Uh, we're calling them caretakers because they all, we've decided that one criteria for them is that they all have to love the open internet. So the first thing we thought of was jurisdictional diversity. We don't want one country's bad laws affecting the entire network. So we've decided that no more than half can be from any one country. Uh, the second point was financial interest. We want more than half of them to be not-for-profits. So we've announced a few of the nodes already. Uh, a scribe is going to be It's an open source software foundry that has designed the free coin for the, the EU's descent project. And Right, I'm Henning. I'm working for IBM. Uh, can I have the clicker for the slides? And uh, while I get it, uh, one thing that's important is I'm uh, here saying my own opinion. It's not, I'm not speaking for IBM today. So I'm working for a project that's called Blue Horizon. And uh, that's uh, the clicker works. Thank you. So that's, that's why, how it looks. That's a proof of concept. Um, it's as mechanical as it can be. It's a Raspberry Pi. And by the way, on the end, there is a link um, for everybody who is interested in this kind of toys uh, who would like to participate. You're invited to join the party there. Um, so basically what um, the Internet of Things and blockchain connection is, um, is that we have three different architectures that we're going through here. We used to have proprietary centralized networks. Now we have the cloud, that is um, the graphic in the middle, and where we're going to is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, topology that is uh, where the blockchain is a very important tool, but it's not the only tool in this peer-to-peer -peer world. And what's behind uh, this development, basically... What? What? <laughs> so this is too complicated for me. So... <laughs> Are you doing it now, or am I doing it with a delay? <laughs> okay, good. So um, we're at the threshold of, a, of an explosion of capacity in the IoT world. That's because processors are getting smaller and smaller. And so while now we have billions of IoT devices, we're going to have uh, 50 billion IoT devices soon. And there has to be some breakthrough in the technology of how to manage them at any rate. And the blockchain comes in handy at this point on the next slide. Um, to uh, break through uh, these thresholds that we have to tackle there in scalability. Internet of Things, per se, has been around for a while. It hasn't fulfilled promises as their expectations were. But there are some uh, hidden success stories. For example, jet engines are completely instrumented nowadays. They are kind of IoT devices. And uh, they are sending home the data all the time. Smart meters are another story that everybody knows uh, now about 
but smart TVs, for example, didn't catch on, as might have been expected. Um, so in 2014, IBM, uh, IBM Think Tank um, published a very forward-looking um, uh, paper called Democracy of Devices. And basically the argument there was that to be able to grow to, and to be able to have, live in a world that has a pervasiveness of IoT devices, people will not accept that all these devices spy on them and leak, and, and leak their data out into the world as a business model. But there has to be a fundamental rethinking where the devices should ideally be owned by the owners and not by the manufacturers, or the devices should even own themselves. Um, what, we, what was postulated in that paper was that the power in IoT will actually shift toward the edge. And um, at that point, when we, when we see that the connectivity and the intelligence is going to be shifted more and more towards the devices themselves, we're going to have a different way, a different experience of how we're going to um, be going about our daily lives. For example, you might not be owning a washing machine anymore, but you're just going to have access to the service to get, you, you, um, get wa st your stuff washed. And in the end, that's what you actually want. And this is a very powerful um, meme, of course, um, if you look at the sharing economy and what's missing there as, as possibilities, just on the technical level. Um, so, but what we are doing with Blue Horizon is very focused on machine-to-machine -machine marketplaces. And this is something that the blockchain will bring us, where we will see that marketplaces can spring up that cover niche markets, that will allow new markets that are not possible right now because the overhead of policing them is just too big. If you think of some uh, stupid example, like if you want to insure your wedding against um, rain, so um, in the moment, the reality is that this kind of market that people would be very interested in does not exist because the overhead of organizing this kind of futures market is just too big. And even the futures that farmers can buy are incredibly expensive because of the infrastructure that has to be built around that. Now, the blockchain is actually allowing us to have markets that police themselves, to have contracts that execute themselves. You don't need lawyers. You don't need notaries for that. And they will allow to create this new kind of niche markets that in the moment just can't exist. Not because the happy path wouldn't work, but because it would be too easy to cheat in them. So a truly decentralized IoT needs four different components, and one of them is the blockchain. While you, you could argue that um, uh, identity is uh, kind of a very special case in this, in this uh, scenario that we're not covering with Blue Horizon, we're tackling all of the other um, areas, and we're using BitTorrent, we're using TallyHash, and we're using blockchain, and in our case, Ethereum, to implement this. And what we're really going for is um, data at the edge. Now, these BlackBerry Pies that I showed in the beginning, they have a little antenna. And this antenna is used, and that's just a proof of concept. This antenna is used to listen into radio. And there's a huge amount of radio data out there where you can, uh, if you go to the next slide, um, you can listen into, for example, in the United States, an incredibly um, diverse uh, uh, universe of data and of information. If you go to the next slide, um, for example, you have a very small band there. This is how it looks. Uh, some has flight information, some has water meters. The next slide. And this is, for example, how the, the water meters look in the, in the United States. You can actually read uh, out the water meters, the smart meters of your neighbors now. This is how flight data looks. Thanks. Next slide. Um, so uh, this doesn't look like it should, does it? No, it doesn't. So this is um, actually one, a proof of concept where we're tracking flight data because all, all, most planes are sending their flight data over radio. And we have a little company that we uh, basically aping flight aware. And we're saying, okay, so we have little... Raspberry Pis that volunteers put into their homes with their antennas, they're picking up the planes, and then a company that is our proof of concept is basically renting access to the data of the individuals who are offering to sell the flight information that they're picking up from the air to those companies. So this is a whole new world of retail data models and data startups, data-driven startups that could emerge from this kind of um, uh, topology. Yeah, if you go through the next slides a little, no, not too fast, but <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so there's, there's another proof of concept that's basically about um, measuring how good your internet connection is, which uh, you have a hard time doing yourself. In the next slides. This is how this is the result you're getting from that. Next slide. This is where you can listen into actual radio, actually FM radio, and can analyze on the next slide um, how uh, it looks if you really zoom into the individual channels. On the next slide, we have uh, this is what we're basically contributing to the space because we have to. We're also helping debugging Ethereum at this point, um, and yeah. So no, two slides forward. Thank you. If you would like to participate, bluehorizon.network is the URL. And we'd be very happy to welcome you to uh, join this little experiment. And with that, I'm giving it to Brendan. Thank you uh, all for your talk. Um, time check, um, how much do we have? Two minutes total? And then the break. And then the break, yes. OK, um, well, I guess in that case, maybe, what will we talk about? Uh, I guess identity. I identity is one of the more interesting things that kind of was hinted at throughout each project. And um, the, you, you said the point about like everything being on Facebook or YouTube, et cetera, right now. And it's, it's quite interesting. You walk outside of the event space where this is and you see a sign and you see three different uh, usernames on each of these networks. You say the at one for Twitter and they have one with an icon for Instagram and one with for, for um, YouTube, and it's like we had a great, pretty user-friendly naming system 20 years ago. Over, like you know, in, with with the dot com, right? The, a domain name, you know, and, and, and there's one right there. There's a, a new domain name. Yet we've seen the shift with all of these companies that have risen up, and it's due to the software underneath it, right? And the user experience of this software that made this publishing easy. I guess for the people implementing things, what you're not talking about identity, but you two. How are you two um, on a scribe and Arcade City planning to handle identity so that you don't become a silo and a broker of my identity? We're looking at implementing a driver um, co-op model where you have your identity. It's associated with like a hash so that's you. You can associate it just with a blockchain hash so there's no other identifying information. If you want to transact privately with your friends and have no one know your identity, that's completely fine. Uh, if you want to be kind of rated in our reputation system, uh, you'll be able to connect your Facebook, your Twitter, your YouTube, whatever information you want to share publicly, or maybe you don't want to share it publicly. Maybe you just want it kind of authorized in the system and have it show that you have verified that even though you're not sharing it. The big thing that we want to do with Arcade City that I think is, is relevant to, to folks who are interested in, in platform cooperativism, which is a big reason why you know I, I came here to learn learn more about that. Um, <clears throat> we want to allow drivers to be able to organize themselves. We we see that the blockchain, in that it being an operating system underlying a, a decentralized, open, distributed organization, um, can really help to solve the, the labor problem that Uber and Lyft are having, Uber in particular, uh, having all of these lawsuits about independent contractors or employees and, and uh, you know, mistreating their workforce and these battles now in New York, they just had to concede to allow this association to form. Well, how about instead of a corporation fighting its workforces organizing, how about you actually allow and encourage that? How about you actually allow drivers to share their information conditionally with groups of drivers in their local area that they may want to team up with? We're seeing this dynamic emerge organically already. Uh, so to be able to use the blockchain to allow people to conditionally share data with parties that they want, to be able to grant and revoke that consent, have all of this be managed transparently on the blockchain in an open source manner, um, happy to t talk further with anyone about this. Uh, we're not specifically building anything to deal with identity, but I think uh, I think uh, Big Chain DB and other blockchain type platforms could really assist with this. In that, it doesn't really make sense for a whole bunch of other people to hold little snippets of your identity. Your identity belongs just with you and to you, 
and you should be the one to, to own it. And, and as uh, William said in the last session, why should Facebook be the one profiting from your identity? Why, why, if, you, if it's going to be sold, why shouldn't you be the one to sell it and benefit from it or choose not to sell it? Uh, so I, I think blockchain will really enable that kind of independence to allow individuals to choose their identity, to securely prove who they are to other people without having a third party have to verify it, and to really take charge of their own selves. I would like uh, to add something to that. I'm in the Koala work group, actually, uh, where we're working on a paper uh, about identity to be dispersed to government bodies and, and people to the, to the broader public. So um, it's very interesting to see that blockchain, and it starts with Bitcoin, really has a different notion of identity than what usually governments or regulators have. In Bitcoin, you have the power to, of agency. You have a key that you can sign stuff with to make things happen. And what you absolutely don't have is a reconnection from what happened um, to that key to your person. It can be found out using metadata and, and using other links, but it's not part of the system, actually. So what regulators want and what, what the law needs, usually, is an identity that has the complementary part of that, which is finding out who did something, who's responsible, to been, then be able to punish. And this kind of um, identity basically has been canceled out of Bitcoin by design. Uh, making, by making the agency part so strong that you actually don't need the other part. Now you have irreversible transactions from that, but uh, I'm sure this is something that's going to be addressed. But you're looking at it on a more fundamental level, on a more philosophical level, it's pretty interesting that this kind of goes, worst case, into a minority report scenario where crime is averted before it can even happen. But on the other hand, it takes down a lot of arguments about know your customer and uh, anti-money laundering law that require you to give up everything about you, basically, to be even part to allowed, be allowed to take part in transactions. Thank you. Um, I think that's time for um, the break. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're going to have a brief break and then come back. So, yeah.